when the great Inca conqueror, Tupac Inca Yupanqui, died in 1493, he left 62 sons. And it was one of his youngest sons, a guy named Huayna Capac, his young king, who would succeed him. But Huayna Capac had a problem. See, according to a tradition laid down by Huayna Capac's grandfather, the first true Inca emperor named Pachacuti, all of the new territory that a Sapa Inca conquered would be inherited by the Sapa Inca's mummy, his idols, and his direct descendants, not including the new Sapa Inca. So if the new Sapa Inca, like Juan Capac, wanted his mummy to inherit territory, wanted his idols and his, his direct descendants to inherit territory, he needed to go out and conquer new territory. But the problem was, between his grandfather and his father, especially his father, all of the known world, essentially, had already been conquered. So what was he supposed to do? Well, he embarked on a grand imperial tour. He, you know, beefed up garrisons and appointed new generals and suppressed rebellions and built palaces for himself, uh, oversaw the forced, you know, recolonization, very Inca, this is an Inca thing to do, Assyria-like, recolonize this population to another part of the empire for strategic purposes. He did all the imperial things, but as he's doing that, He's scoping out territory. He's trying to figure out what direction should he go to conquer his new territory. As he traveled, he seems to have come to the conclusion that, well, he couldn't go east. To the east lay jungle and swamps filled with savage tribes and head shrinkers and others. So forget the east. To the south, the Inca Empire had already been stretched all the way to the Rio Maule. And below that, you've got these fierce Mapuche people in their forest fastnesses that prevented any further southern expansion. To the west, of course, was the Great Sea that stretched onto the horizon. So forget the west. The only direction that seemed possible was the north, here in Ecuador, where the groundwork had already been laid by his father, and his father's conquest of the Kitukara people, the kingdom of Quito. And so Huayna Capac set off. He marched north, having prepared an army of 200,000 men. Of course, also making the requisite ritual preparations, which in this case involved the sacrifice of children, an Inca custom. So he marches north, and everywhere he goes, you know, people are streaming down from the hills by the thousands to catch a glimpse of the sun of the sun. On the way to Ecuador, he reconquered the Chachapoyas, the people of the clouds, who had rebelled. They'd been conquered by his father, but rebelled upon the coronation of Huayna Capac. When Huayna Capac arrived here in Ecuador, in the city of Tumepamba, the Inca city of Tumepamba, previously a Cañari city, but conquered by his father. It was like Huayna Capac had come home. This was, after all, where he had been born. This is where he was from. He was born during the great northern campaigns of his father, Tupac Inca, right here. Tupac Inca had tried to make Tumepamba a northern capital to rival Cusco itself, and he built a palace here. And in the palace, there was a golden huaca of Huayna Capac's mother, within which was Juan Capac's actual placenta, the home indeed. Uh, there's not much left of Tumapamba today. Today, this is the modern city of Cuenca, but there are bits and pieces. Well, in any case, now Juan Capac was back. And like his father, he was accompanied by 200,000 Inca troops. So a massive army. He spent some time reveling in drink and women with his men before moving further north to Quito. See, it was the land north of Quito, the as yet unconquered territory where he could earn glory, where he could earn his own personal conquests, something to pass on to his mummy and to his direct descendants. And so far, everything had gone really well. Everywhere he went, Huayna Capac inspired awe. People wanted to see him, even here in Quito in the far north. Now, to secure his position in preparation for the campaign against the locals, he built several forts right in this area, Pamba Marca. Now, there were several other forts already built here by the locals, anti-Inca forts, in preparation for a defense against his would-be conquest. But the image of the invincible Inca, that was about to be shattered. It took Juan de Capac the better part of two decades, about 17 years, to actually conquer this far northern area. One people in particular, the Cayambe, built forts of their own before the Inca even showed up in anticipation of just 
this sort of thing happening. This is what prompted the Incas to build their forts, sort of counter forts. The Cayambe withstood Inca siege after siege. But eventually, after all that blood, Inca blood, local blood, you know, drenching the earth, the Cayambe, the Otavalo, the Cochasqui, and others, the Caranqui, all fell and were subdued by Huayna Capac. When victory finally did come, rebellion almost immediately broke out. And Huayna Capac's response to that rebellion was brutal. According to tradition, all of the male population of the Caranqui were marched down to this lake right here and slaughtered, every one of them, thousands of people. The blood of the Caranqui, according to tradition, made the waters of the lake run red. And its name to this day has preserved that idea, Yaguar Cocha, Blood Lake. Now the Pasto people, even further north, were never fully conquered by the Inca, thus preventing the Inca from making a push into modern-day Colombia. Juan Acapac did go on to conquer pretty much all of the lowlands in the coastal plain of Ecuador, but it wasn't easy. In fact, at one point he tried to take Puna Island, which is right there. You can see it across the way here. Very large island, uh, about an hour from what is today Guayaquil. Anyway, Inca nobles were ferried across. The locals, who happened to be cannibals, uh, entertained them. There were feasts, who knows what they were eating. But then, as they were being ferried back, these Inca nobles, by the locals, the locals who were expert swimmers, undid the log rafts. They pulled out the ropes so that these Incas, weighed down, drowned. Now, they were looted as they drowned, and then the locals were able to, mid-water, rope back up the rafts and swim back. And they, they did that multiple times till all the Incas who'd gone over had been ferried halfway and then sunk to the bottom. So Puna never actually conquered by the Incas. Juana Capac felt so bad about this episode, by the way, that he actually had it memorialized in song by his bards. Other problems seem to come from right within his own camp. I mean, uh, think about it. Most of his men are not from Ecuador. They're from the far south. They're from Cusco. They're from the region around Cusco. They've been away for years and years at this point, and Huayna Capac seems to have no problem with Tumapamba becoming something of an imperial capital. It, it's now rivaling Cusco, because that's where the Sapa Inca is, and has been for a long time. And at one point, so we're told, only the pleas of a priestess could prevent a mass desertion. And couple this with bad omens. There are bad omens. There's, you know, an eagle falling from the sky. There's increased volcanic activity, earthquakes, tempestuous seas, dreams of ghostly hordes, signs in the night sky. All this comes together to sort of portend evil, something ominous on the horizon. And it was about this time that news reached Tumapamba of the odd arrival of a bunch of strange foreigners. No one had ever seen anyone like these guys. They traveled on floating wooden houses, mansions really. They came ashore during the day and entered the houses of Incan nobles with impunity, stealing their stuff and, and just walking away. They were white, they had silver jackets, they were bearded, they communicated using hand gestures. They carried sticks that spoke like thunder. I mean, who were these people and what did they want? Huayna Capac, terrified, had his messengers repeat the story again and again and finally resolved that these new arrivals needed to be hauled before him and explain themselves. So he ordered that it happen, but by the time the orders reached the shore, these strangers had gone. And as far as we know, Huayna Capac never met a Spaniard. Well, the strange arrival and departure of these foreigners was soon forgotten because the empire was struck with a sickness, a plague, devastating plague, that ended up claiming the lives of something like 200,000 people. It seemed to start in the far south, around Cusco, which is interesting if you think about it. But anyway, it seemed to start around Cusco, but then spread north, and around 1527, Huayna Capac himself was struck ill with this plague, 
And so he quickly named his successor just in case. She named him twice. And so the priests did their divination. Essentially, they read llama innards. And according to their divination, uh, Huayna Capac's named successor, well, he didn't have a great future. And indeed, shortly thereafter, this named successor died. As for Huayna Capac himself, he received a prescription from the oracle at Pachacamac. And that prescription was exposure, exposure to the sun. Well, he was already dying and in a weakened state. Exposure to the beating equatorial sun was probably the last thing that he needed. And Huayna Capac died. The last of a great century-spanning trio of Inca emperors who ruled despotically over what would have seemed to them and their subjects to be virtually the extent of the known world. Huayna Capac's funeral procession now made its long and circuitous way to Cuzco. And along the way, and of course it's his mummy that's being transported to Cuzco. Along the way, thousands and thousands of his subjects stream down from the hills to get a view, to get a glimpse of this mummy. You know, and they're plucking out their eyebrows and blowing them into the wind as a sign of devotion and worship. Once Huayna Capac's mummy had reached Cuzco, 4,000 of his subjects were sacrificed in order to be buried with him. Incidentally, it was Huayna Capac's second choice that actually lived to succeed his father as Sapa Inca. His name was Huascar. Now the priests, they foretold a very troubled reign for Huascar. And as it turned out, their predictions were highly accurate. But that's another story.